our world would not be so great without exploration. <laughs> Open your eyes to discover new horizons. My name is Curiosity. Follow me on this journey. Hello, good morning or good evening, wherever you are on our globe. And a welcome to this virtual world conference on luteinizing hormone in ART. A new galaxy is born. Uh, this is the third uh, meeting, uh, the expert edition on lectures number five and number six. And my name is Robert Fischer. I'm the scientific director of Medea Medical Education Academy. Before we start, I would like uh, to introduce you to some info, uh, important informations. Uh, very important for you is uh, when we finish uh, this expert meeting in about an hour, uh, to fill out the survey uh, and uh, you will find a link at the bottom of your screen when we finish. And this is important in order to receive your CME certificate. You can also ask questions during this expert meeting. Uh, you have uh, a chat room uh, where you can enter your questions. We can see your questions on the screen and we'll choose them uh, to ask the expert uh, uh, to answer your questions. So please feel free to answer as many as you wish. And this expert meeting uh, will be available on playback uh, on www.lh2020.education anytime from now on. So you can come back and uh, see, or if you missed this expert meeting today, you can still have a second look at it. I also want to remind you that you can send abstracts. And we extended uh, the deadline of submission of abstract until the next Saturday, the 31st of October. And just to remind you, the two winning abstracts will be presented live during our closing ceremony on the 14th of November. Now, meetings like this, even if they are as a virtual meeting nowadays and not face-to-face, uh, -face, still uh, need a special uh, independent educational grant. And we are very happy that we could receive a grant like that, especially from the healthcare business of Merck in Darmstadt, Germany, but also an additional contribution from the GE Healthcare Company. And uh, just to let you know that up to now, uh, 905 registered uh, to this uh, virtual uh, conference. And uh, they come from 66 uh, countries. You can see here a list of all the countries all around the globe. Most of you who registered are very experienced, uh, working more than 10 years in our field. And also most of you are very busy units as you can see from the slide. Just to remind you that we are still having three more uh, uh, expert meetings. Uh, the next one will be coming Saturday on the 31st of October, and uh, that will be on lectures seven and eight by 
Professor Hoog and uh, Dr. Sunkara. And on the 7th of the November on lectures 9 and 10 by Professor Rain Fanning and Professor Ubaldi. And on the 14th of November on lectures number 11 and 12 by Professor Humaydan and Philippe Lehert. So just uh, keep in mind and uh, keep the dates and uh, join us on those three expert meetings as well. So uh, it's a pleasure now to call upon our uh, first expert uh, today. And uh, this is uh, Professor Sandro Esteves uh, from Campinas in Brazil. So Sandro, welcome to join us. It's a pleasure to have you. We had you also the last week, but uh, it's always a pleasure to have you in this meeting. And um, Professor Esteves uh, is uh, uh, the medical director of uh, Androferge, which is an andrology and human reproduction clinic in Campinas in Brazil. He is originally an andrologist, but also expert in reproductive medicine. And uh, he is a professor at the University of Campinas, but also associate professor at Aarhus University in Denmark and at the American uh, Center of Reproductive Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. He's very experienced, published a lot, and he is one of the founding pylons of uh, the Poseidon Group. And uh, that's uh, why we are very happy that he will be presenting and summarizing today his presentation that you have been uh, already enjoying in the last two weeks uh, on the topic of the Poseidon, uh, the novel Poseidon classification, what, what is it? And uh, during uh, his uh, uh, presentation and uh, discussion, you can ask questions, as I told you, but you will also see on your right side uh, a couple of multiple choice questions that Professor Esteves has prepared for you. You can answer during uh, this uh, uh, time, at any time, on uh, these uh, questions. And at the end of the discussion, we shall show you uh, the results of uh, your um, answers. And Professor Esteves uh, will comment on, on the results. So, Sandro, please, the stage is yours now. Thank you very much, Robert. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much for attending this expert meeting. And uh, this one relates specifically with a talk I uh, recorded on the Poseidon classification, and I will summarize in the next five, 10 minutes, the key issues of the Poseidon classification that I included in, uh, in my talk. Here uh, are my disclosures. I uh, have received lecture fees from Merck, Medea, and Academy and also uh, research grants from Merck. Uh, the Poseidon classification. This is a new classification that was uh, published in 2015 uh, by the Poseidon Group. The Poseidon Group is a group of experts uh, that were actually put together under the initiative of Professor Alvidi, that will be our next speaker in this expert meeting, Professor Alvidi from Naples, Italy, with a group of experts, we uh, actually uh, prepared, proposed a new and more detailed stratification of low responder patients to ovarian stimulation. So the Poseidon actually is an acronym for patient-oriented strategies encompassing individualized oocyte number. But Poseidon is also the name of the site in Ischia, Italy, that was actually the venue for the group to get together and also prepare, let's say, the Poseidon classification. So based on age, Ovarian biomarkers, specifically AMH or AFC, a number of oocytes retrieved in a previous cycle, if that information was available, 
we can classify patients into four Poseidon groups. So groups three and four that you see in your screen are expected poor responders because they have abnormal, let's say, ovarian markers, AFC and AMH. So the cutoff point of AFC is five and the cutoff point of AMH is 1.2 based on published literature. So we have these markers for AFC using the two-dimensional ultrasound as a marker, as a cutoff point that predict poor response in ovarian stimulation. And we have also publications showing that 1.2 related to AMH using the generation two AMH assay, the manual assay is actually uh, accurate to predict poor response in ovarian stimulation. So we have used the cutoff points already published. And then groups three and four are expected poor responders. Groups one and two, they are patients that might looks like as poor responders because they have got in a previous ovarian stimulation cycle unexpected low, I mean less than four or suboptimal between four and nine oocytes retrieved. Unexpected because these patients have adequate ovarian markers. I mean, they are above the cutoff points that I have described before. But not only oocyte number and the expected number of oocytes is important. We need to take into consideration female age as a surrogate marker of oocyte quality. And then based on several publications showing that the threshold of 35 years old is actually important to discriminate patients with low risk of oocyte and embryo aneuploidy versus high risk of oocyte and embryo aneuploidy, we have used the cutoff point of 35 years to stratify patients in the, let's say, up category, groups one and two, based on age, and groups three and four, again, younger and older patients. So you have four Poseidon groups. Uh, so in summary, we have young and old, older, let's say, patients with adequate ovarian markers, but an expected lower suboptimal ovarian response. This is groups one and two. And then we have younger and older patients again with an expected low oocyte number because they have inadequate abnormal ovarian markers. They are groups three and four. So we have on the left side patients the younger patients, they have low embryo aneuploid risk. By contrast, on the right side, we have older patients with high embryo aneuploid risk, but all of them, they are low prognosis patients in terms of reproductive success. What I mean, they will have few embryos generated. Therefore, they will have less opportunity to have these embryos actually transferred to kind of provide a live birth. So when we say that the Poseidon patients have low prognosis, we are talking about cumulative live birth rate per started cycle. So one stimulation, how many oocytes and therefore embryos we will get, will kind of make these patients less favorable compared to non-Poseidon patients. Then I introduce to you group five, which could be non-Poseidon patients, patients who are not fitting the Poseidon criteria because they have adequate ovarian markers and more than nine oocytes retrieved. So we can compare the Poseidon patients with this patient population. So the group introduced the concept of low prognosis in ART. So these are not poor responders. Low prognosis is a more broad concept combining oocyte quality and quantity for the identification and also stratification of the low prognosis patients. Besides that, the Poseidon group introduced the FOI, FOI's follicle to oocyte index. It's a metric 
to identify hyper responders to ovarian stimulation using exogenous gonadotropins. And also the group introduced an intermediate marker of success in ARC, which is the number of oocytes needed to obtain at least one euploid blastocyst for transfer in each patient. Briefly, the follicle to oocyte index is the ratio between the number of oocytes ultimately retrieved after a conventional ovarian stimulation per the antrofollicle count. So using FOI, the clinician like you and me will be able to understand what was the performance of that particular patient in a ovarian stimulation cycle. So were we able to actually take advantage of the ovarian reserve in terms of the antrofollicle count, turning that reserve in real oocytes to be used in the laboratory, or we actually had some problems. So we had some unpublished new data that I'm presenting the graph on the right side, uh, including uh, more than 10,000 patients from three different centers. This is a ongoing study in which we are looking at the Poseidon groups and also comparing the Poseidon groups with non-Poseidon patients. And what we see very clearly is that patients in groups one and two, they have significantly lower FOI compared to groups three, four, and non-Poseidon patients. What does it mean? These patients, they actually are not being completely, uh, the ovarian reserve has not been completely used during the stimulation. So we can do better. And then we could use also the Poseidon criteria, try to identify possible strategies to overcome the low FOI in groups one and two, for instance, and other strategies to improve the uh, cumulative live birth rate for groups three and four. So Poseidon is also a uh, criteria that could be used for the clinician to design and then implement treatment strategies for this challenging patient population. So concerning the metric that I have uh, explained to you before, uh, we, we, you can estimate the number of oocytes needed to obtain at least one euploid blastocyst for embryo using your data set from your clinic, or you can use a predictive model. So we had the idea to develop a predictive model to estimate that number. And then we published the first paper, which was the paper in which actually uh, the art calculator was derived from. So we created a online calculator to actually predict the number of oocytes needed to obtain at least one euploid blastocyst for transfer. The art calculator is available uh, in the Poseidon website, www.groupposeidon.com. So in the Poseidon website, the art calculator is available. We have used the art calculator in our center extensively in clinical practice. It provides two types of predictions. Pre-treatment, you input information, and then the calculator will give you an output, which is the minimum number of metaphase two oocytes to achieve at least one euploid blastocyst for transfer with the 95% confidence interval. And one thing that you can do is actually you can uh, define the probability of success you want to have in your estimation. So the higher the probability, the higher the number of oocytes the calculator will, will produce. This is important for patient counseling and discussion. And also the calculator provides post-treatment information. I mean, when you get that oocyte number and then you input that number, and the calculator will provide you a revised estimate of the probability of achieving at least one euploid blastocyst. So you can discuss with your patient and then prepare eventually a different stimulation 
or going ahead with that information. So the ART calculator was validated recently in a study, uh, a multi-center, multinational study uh, involving centers in Brazil, Italy, and Turkey. And uh, the validation study is now published, essentially uh, providing information that, that the calculator could be generalized somehow for other centers uh, and then offer guidance for clinicians on the minimum number of metaphase tool sites needed to estimate the uh, at least one uh, uploid blastocyst for transfer. And importantly, without using PGTA, you don't need to use PGTA. It's the calculator will provide an estimation. So for uh, the Poseidon criteria, what are then the advantages for clinicians and patients? We have the first of all important information for diagnosis because it provides more detailed stratification of our patients undergoing IVF and ICSI according to their actually prognosis. For counseling, we uh, now are able to estimate the number of oocytes needed to achieve at least one euploid embryo, for instance, using the ART calculator. And that could be used to shape patient expectations about the actual prognosis of success. This is important to prepare the patients emotionally and financially for the treatment journey. And also facilitates mature discussion about the treatment options we could offer to our patients. And concerning treatment, then we might design patient-oriented and also patient-centered strategies for each Poseidon group. And this is an evident contribution to total quality management in our, in our fertility clinics. Also for researchers, the Poseidon criteria could be used to select in more homogeneous groups of patients to test in interventional trials. And the Poseidon mat metrics can be used either as primary or secondary endpoints in these interventional trials. So the endpoint could be number of oocytes and embryos, the follicle to oocyte index, the ability of that particular intervention to obtain the number of oocytes required as estimated by the ART calculator to obtain at least one euploid embryo. And extremely important is the primary endpoint of the Poseidon criteria is cumulative live birth rate per initiated cycle. And we can also discuss about time to pregnancy that could be uh, another endpoint to be considered. So the Poseidon group has a, a brief history. It started in 2015, but there are several achievements uh, during these last five years. The group is open to members across the globe. And after the initial uh, founders actually introduced the Poseidon criteria, we created a dedicated educational website with www.groupposeidon.com in which you can apply for membership. And we have now more than 100 members from 17 countries and four continents. In the website, we have the online art calculator that I explained to you. We have the papers about the art calculator and the validation studies. The group has uh, um, contributed a uh, research topic. It's a journal supplement, which is online in Frontiers in Endocrinology. All articles are open access. We have more than 15 articles in that particular supplement going through A to Z concerning the Poseidon criteria. And more importantly, several independent groups across the globe have been publishing papers using the Poseidon criteria. If you go to PubMed today, you see that we have more than 40 peer-reviewed papers, reviews, original articles, prospective studies on Poseidon criteria. In several meetings, uh, we are, and others, sharing new information, data about the Poseidon criteria, 
uh, in clinical practice and research. And we now have about four clinical trials registered using the Poseidon criteria to explore different interventions. So I'm very glad and honored to be part of this group. Uh, I invite all of you to visit our website and consider becoming a member of the Poseidon group and contribute to the ideas and research uh, to expand knowledge for this challenging uh, patient population, which is the low prognosis patients undergoing IVF and ICSI. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandro, very much. Uh, it was a very nice uh, overview of uh, and overlook of uh, what you have uh, given us also in your uh, more largely presentation. And uh, we are not having too much time now, but uh, there are a few questions uh, which already arrived. And uh, the first one um, is asking about uh, the difference uh, between uh, using either antral follicle count or AMH as a uh, possibility to uh, do the uh, classification to the Poseidon subgroup. So is it a difference by using uh, one of them or do we need to use both of them? That was the question. I think this is a great question because according to the, uh, to the Poseidon criteria, clinicians can use one or the other or even both. So we are conducting a agreement study between a AFC and AMH. And what we see in this study that is still unpublished is that we have a high correlation between AFC and AMH in terms of the kappa agreement over 0.8 for actually classifying the Poseidon patient. So according to our data, uh, clinicians can use either AFC or AMH to classify the Poseidon patients. Obviously, if you use both, you you have some patients without a classification because there, uh, let's say, discrepancy in a certain patients using AFC and AMH. So I think the uh, clinic has to use the marker that the doctor is more confident with and then use just one marker actually to classify the postpartum patients. There's no need to combine both markers, in my opinion. Uh, another question uh, that came up uh, was, uh, and this uh, also usually a very regular question, and I think you mentioned it already in your summary. Um, people are afraid by using a calculator because they think they have to do a PGT-A on uh, to find out if the embryo is, is euploid. Can you just repeat again if a PGTA is absolutely necessary uh, using uh, uh, the calculator or the uh, Poseidon subgrouping? No, it's not. There's no need to do PGTA. The reason why we decided to have a metric in which we are looking at the number of all sites needed to have at least one euploid blastocyst is because Having a euploid embryo offset, at least partially, the negative effect of female age on implantation and then pregnancy. So across all age groups, I believe most of the clinics see implantation rates above 50%, equal or above 50% when we have a euploid embryo. So this is the metric. And we can objectively estimate the number of oocytes needed to have at least one euploid blastocyst. But this is the prediction model. We obviously, when we designed it and developed and validated the calculator, we used a data set in which we had the PGTA results because we need to validate the numbers we are providing and then making the algorithm and then, uh, I mean, the, the accuracy of that model. But the clinician will just input the most important predictors for having euploid blastocyst, which is basically female age and sperm source, specifically if the patient has sperm taken from the testicle of patient with non-obstructive azospermia, that will modulate the number of oocytes a little bit. But basically female age is the main factor for the predictive model. Yeah, 
I think uh, that uh, we have run already through all the questions which arrived. Most of them repeat themselves uh, according uh, to, to what I can see. So, but we also have now the answers uh, ready to the multiple choice question, the two of them that you have prepared. So maybe we can show the first question and if you want to comment uh, maybe on the result, uh, what you receive. So the first question was the proportion of low prognosis patient as per the Poseidon criteria undergoing IVF. And we had four choices. So would you like to comment on the result, on the answers? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, I think a 30 to 70 percent range is quite quite reasonable for the Poseidon Poseidon patients. We also have a study that is about to be submitted on a large data set showing that overall Poseidon patients represent between 40 and 55 percent of patients we see in our clinic. So it's quite accurate to say that around 40 percent, uh, according to pay, to countries and of also patient characteristics, but this is quite 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 accurate number provided by the responders. About two thirds of our, of our registered participants uh, did uh, mention the correct answer, which was very good actually. So let's have a look at the second question. So the second question was about uh, the term low prognosis uh, in the context of the Poseidon classification. Um, and uh, the, answer, the question was to what it is referring, ongoing pregnancy rate, clinical pregnancy rate, cumulative live birth rate or miscarriage rate. Please comment, Sandro. Yeah, as, as I, I stressed in my presentation and the summary today, low prognosis refers to cumulative live birth rates per initiated cycle according to the ICMART definition. So, this is important consideration because even for the endpoints in interventional studies and retrospective data analysis, the cumulative live birth rate makes the Poseidon population uh, different from non-Poseidon patients. And also the four Poseidon groups differ among them. They have different cumulative live birth rates. So it's important to consider that endpoint because Poseidon patients, as I said before, will have lower or suboptimal oocyte numbers, therefore reduced number of embryos and obviously allowing less opportunities for repeated transfers if the patient fails the first embryo transfer, so resulting in lower cumulative live birth rates. Okay, thank you very much, Sandro, for joining us today. And uh, again, uh, summarizing uh, your excellent presentation on uh, the basics uh, of Poseidon group and also the Poseidon criteria. You are one of the biggest pylons of this uh, group and a very active pylon, as I would say, of uh, most of us. And it was a pleasure to have you here with us today. So please stay healthy and safe. Thank you very much to all of you. Have a wonderful expert, now, next expert meeting. And now it's my pleasure to invite our second expert for today, also a big pylon and uh, actually the initiator of the uh, Poseidon uh, group, uh, Professor Carlo Alvigi from... Hello, Carlo. Good to have you with us today. today as an expert, not as a moderator. Yes. And, uh, yes. You, you will be discussing your presentation on the management of the four Poseidon uh, subgroups. And to all of you who uh, don't know Professor Alvigi, I'm sure there are not so many. Uh, professor Alvigi is a professor at the University of Federico II in Naples in uh, Italy and uh, he is uh, head of the reproductive medicine uh, fertility unit at the university. He is also very active in LH research and very active in receptor polymorphisms 
uh, polymorphism of the gonadotropins and published and uh, presented a lot of his work uh, worldwide. So he was also the one who initiated the Poseidon group. So we have now one of the biggest experts on Poseidon to discuss with us the management of the four Poseidon groups that uh, Professor Esteves produced to us. So, Carlo, please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Robert, for your nice introduction and welcome to all of you, wherever you are. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a privilege for me to be here today and to talk about the possibilities of management of Poseidon patients. This is a very difficult issue, but I will try to give you some suggestion and to share ideas. And I do hope that we'll have a very nice discussion later. So I have to come back just for one, two minutes to the classification that Professor Esteves presented before, just because we need a starting point. And uh, I have to repeat something that, in my opinion, is crucial. The concept is always there. Poseidon is not classification for poor response. Poor response is a crucial part, is a very relevant aspect in prognosis, but it is not the only one. So we tried to move from the idea of a poor ovarian response to the idea of low prognosis. So as Sandro presented before, we have uh, four groups, and in group one and two, younger and older patients. The main aspect is that in these patients, the ovarian response is lower than expected. They are patients that basically have a good ovarian reserve and they have an expected good response, but following stimulation, in brief, they have less eggs than expected. Group three and four, Again, younger and older patients, group three and four are patients where the low ovarian response is expected because they are patients with the low ovarian reserve. This is a crucial point because if we want to manage patients, but even if we want to design trials, we have to fully understand that pathogenesis and characteristics of these four groups are different each other. Professor Esteves made an incredible work in the last years engaging people from many countries to try to understand something. And what emerged? That if we consider the four groups, in the four groups, the prognosis is uh, lower, is worsen when compared with the non Poseidon good prognosis patient. But if you have a look inside each one of the group, the prognosis in terms of a cumulative life birth rate is different each other. So these groups are homogeneous inside, but are heterogeneous if we consider comparisons. This is crucial because if you have a look to Bologna criteria, the concept is not the same because in the Bologna criteria, patients have a similar prognosis, but different pathogenesis and different prob problems at the basis of uh, the low prognosis, but they always uh, are in the same box in the clinical practice and in designing trials. So this is a crucial point. Low prognosis is different and can be related to different problems. And the poor ovarian response is a just part of the problem. It's not the only cause of low prognosis. So I will take just a few minutes to suggest, because we cannot talk about recommendation, we are talking about clinical practice. I will give you some suggestion about the management uh, of uh, patients that fill with uh, one of the four preceding groups. And I will start from group one and group two, meaning patients that basically have a good ovarian reserve, but they have an ex unexpected response to stimulation, impaired ovarian response that is not consistent with the initial expectation. So this is something that we proposed inside our group. And uh, what can we consider? We consider three stages of the treatment, pre-treatment, stimulation protocol, and what can we propose at the triggering? So we are talking about patients with a good ovarian reserve, 
but that in a previous stimulation cycle, they had poor or suboptimal retrieval of oocyte. What does it mean? That they had suboptimal means between five and nine oocyte or less than four oocyte for poor ovarian uh, retrieval. So uh, oocyte retrieval. And uh, so if we want to say that the patient is group one or group two Poseidon, we need information from a previous stimulation. So what can we do for a second stimulation? Because here, as the Professor Estevez underlined before, here the problem is that the patient used uh, a small percentage of her potential. So the ovarian reserve is good. For instance, the antrophollicle count is 10, 15, even 20, but this patient had less oocytes than expected. So it makes sense in this patient to re-elaborate stimulation and consider to increase the dose, to consider everything that could improve the fourth, meaning the follicle output rate, or the FOI, the number of eggs we have in consideration of the initial antrophollicle count. So what we can do at the pre-stimulation stage? We can consider an art calculator because this is a very good way for, as Sandro underlined before, have a mature discussion and for counseling and for understanding with the couple what is our aim, the goal that we need. And then, and I will develop this aspect in, in a few minutes, we can even consider genotype screening because one possible cause of hyper response is a polymorphism of FSH receptor or other polymorphisms involving gonotrophins and their receptors. And so we can consider androgens in selected patients, but I think that the, the idea of androgens um, is more related to group, groups three and four, and we will discuss it later. So let's go to stimulation protocol. In case we add genotyping of the patients, we can consider in a second stimulation just to increase the starting dose of FSH. But please note that if the, F, the uh, ser 680 polymorphism of FSH receptor is there uh, in hetero or homozygosis, we should consider to increase the starting dose of 75 or even 150 because there are meta-analyses, there is evidence that the presence of this polymorphism can reduce FOI, can reduce FORT. So if we know that the polymorphism is there, we have to consider to use a higher starting dose of FSH. And we can even consider to add the recombinant age in a two to one ratio because there is evidence that in the hyper responders, perfectly fitting with the group one and group two Poseidon, the combination of FSH and LH is able to increase the ongoing pregnancy rate. And this is a crucial point because the combination of FSH and LH can potentially overcome any single polymorphism involving FSH and LH receptor. If we have patients of age above 35 years, we have to consider to increase the recombinant FSH dosage. And um, we have also to consider the using the art calculator to accumulate oocyte or embryos, because if uh, the aneuploidy rate is very high, for instance, in patients above 38, 39, 40 years of age, uh, the Art calculator can suggest that the ideal number for having at least one nucleoid blastocyst is between 10, 15, even over 15. So if the ovarian reserve is not perfectly consistent with this, we can consider accumulating with the duosteam or other stimulation protocols that are aimed to accumulate oocyte or blastocyst. What is very important is that in patients between 35 and 39, there is evidence that the association of uh, recombinant FSH and the recombinant LH significantly improves both implantation and ongoing pregnancy rate. So this is something that we have to consider in this group of patients if they are between 35 and 39. So if a patient are above 40, we don't know at the moment if the recombinant LH can change the prognosis because the relevance of aneuploidies and the relevance of low ovarian reserve are too heavy, 
are too dominant for hypothesizing that a single gonotrophin can change the results. So it's up to you. But there is evidence that between 35 and 39 years of age, recombinant LH works. What about triggering? Uh, the triggering, obviously, uh, there are no particular consideration. But what is important is uh, obviously consider antagonist regimen and agonist triggering and uh, elective embryo freezing, obviously, for patients that have a very high response or at baseline have a higher antrofollicular count or MH, so patient at risk for ovarian hyperstimulation uh, syndrome. You can consider for patient group two combined with articulator. It's not mandatory, but if you uh, want to improve time to pregnancy, so work on efficiency, not on efficacy, you can consider PGTA. And obviously, we always suggest a single embryo transfer. Uh, what about group three and four? In these patients, we have a, a problem. The problem is that the, the ovarian reserve is low. And I don't think that, no, I think that no gonotrophin can increase the number of antral follicle at the beginning of the cycle. So probably for this patient, the best option is accumulating or trying to do something before stimulation for increasing the antral follicle count. So this is the, the flow chart that uh, summarizes what we can at the moment suggest. So if we are patients with a low ovarian reserve below the 35 years of age, meaning group three poseidin, we wait for the results of the trials, but we can consider pretreatment to try, for instance, antigens, to try to um, uh, increase the antrophollicle count. So we don't know at the moment if it works or not. There are some uh, con controversial data involving uh, DHA, testosterone pretreatment. So we wait for final results of the current trials, but many groups consider pretreatment with androgens. If you don't want to do the pretreatment, and uh, what is very important in these patients is the synchronization of follicles, because when the ovarian reserve is reduced, the anti hormone is very low. So the transition between late luteal phase and initial follicular phase is not well modulated. So the problem we are in, in this patient is that at the beginning of the cycle, of the stimulation cycle, they have dominant follicles, even follicles overcoming nine millimeters. So the synchronization is a crucial point. And what is very important is considering long protocol or estradiol pretreatment or the OCP. This is a, there are different data supporting or underlining controversial aspect. This is just my opinion. The best method in the clinical practice is a synchronization of follicles with the estradiol valerate. This is a very good option. So if we go to stimulation, we have to optimize FORT and FOI. So I think that starting dose of 300 is ideal for these patients because we cannot run the risk of losing growing follicles. Even uh, the ASHRAE guidelines on controlled ovarian stimulation recognized, and I do agree with this, that overcoming 300 international unit as a starting dose of recombinant FSH makes no sense. It's not cost effective and does not improve results. What about, about triggering and retrieval? So obviously the long protocol requires ACG antagonists. We can do both. And if you do do a steam, at least for the first stimulation, uh, um, it is obviously generate agonist trigger to be considered. So what is important is uh, if you have uh, low FOI despite treatment, or you had low FOI in the previous cycle, so you can consider dual or double trigger. So to combine the effect of ACG and generate agonist because it could increase, I think, the percentage of mature oocytes. For patient above 35 years, meaning uh, patient group four Poseidon, the same we can say about pretreatment, the same we can say about stimulation, but I suggest in patient between 35 and 39 years of age, again, to consider the association of recombinant FSH and recombinant LH. 
So I think that uh, in these patients, if they are above 40 uh, or independently of this, uh, it has to be considered the possibility of dual steam of accumulating all site and embryos. I think that this is the group of patients that benefit from this kind of approach. Please note that you have to balance the cost effective analysis because just to give an example, if you have a patient 37 years of age having antral follicle count of four or five, moving from 10, from five to 10 all site in, in uh, two stimulation, consecutive stimulation makes sense because you have more eggs and the aneuploidy rate is still acceptable. So moving from five to 10, you can significantly increase the chance to have at least one aneuploid blastocyst. But you have a patient 42, 43 years of age with uh, two, three follicles of the antral follicle count, double stimulation can move from two to four, five eggs Given that in 43 years of age patients, the rate of aneuploidies is 90%, 87%, probably moving from two to four oocytes do not change significantly the history. So the Poseidon calcul the heart calculator is very good in understanding what we can have in terms of chance of having at least one new deployed blastocyst considering the ovarian reserve of any single patient and the expected rate of aneuploidies for any given age. And even in this case, I think that it is crucial at the triggering to consider the possibility of um, dual or double trigger because even in this, case, uh, in this case, we do need to have the highest percentage of measure all sites. So this is just to conclude. Better stratification of low prognosis women is uh, required at the moment, and the Poseidon classification can help in this because it can help to identify more homogeneous groups of low prognosis patients. That is crucial for clinical practice and is crucial for designing trials for having a good quality meta-analysis in the future. So hyper-response, meaning group one and two uh, Poseidon, can be a genetic trait so it could be hypothesized pharmacogenomic approach for the starting dose or even for considering a late supplementation but independently of pharmacogenomics there is evidence that lh supplementation is beneficial in terms of uh, both oocyte and quality in women with a uh, hyper response to fsh in a previous cycle there is evidence that lh can improve ongoing pregnancy rate in patients above 35 years fitting with the groups two and four Poseidon, and those steam accumulating all site is a valid option for women with the low ovarian reserve, meaning three, four Poseidon groups. And I strongly suggest the art calculator as a tool for understanding what is our aim at the beginning of the stimulation to compare this aim with the possibilities we have, meaning the um, uh, ovarian reserve of any single patient and it is an incred incredible tool for counseling for discussing the prognosis and the way we can give the maximum possibility to any given couple so thank you very much for your time thank you carlo again a wonderful uh, overview of the management of the four groups and we already accumulated quite a few questions uh, to you. And I will start with the first uh, one. The first question was, are group one and group two patients hyporesponders, all of them? Or um, maybe uh, only the ones who have a low FOI? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for this question. Obviously, when you have to define something new, you have to find objective criteria that can be shared all over the world. So the FOI is very simple to measure, is very simple to share in terms of information, and can be even good for having common point for designing trials in the future. Um, there are also other ways for measuring the phenomenon of hyper response. For instance, at the time of a generate long protocol in the past, we uh, talked about um, initial poor responders, stagnation phenomenon, or slow responders. What does it mean? That there are patients that, despite the good ovarian reserve, they are very slow 
at the initial stage of a response. In, um, this is more evident in long protocol because the ovarian response is slower and you have more time for understanding phenomenon. And um, I think that they are also hyper responders because what do we do in this patient? When we see that on day six, seven of stimulation, many follicles are there, but they are not growing. We increase the FSH, we add the LH, and we make the follicles starting in the ongoing stimulation cycle. So another way to identify hyper responders is that you don't have an uh, expected fourth follicle output rate within the first week of stimulation. So you, in the current cycle, can consider to increase the dose or adding a LH. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, another question is uh, also going in that direction. Uh, most of the hyporesponders are due to polymorphism of FSH and LH receptor. Uh, would you suggest, uh, if you don't have, for example, the information uh, for previous cycles, uh, to do a polymorphism test for the receptors on all the patients before starting the first treatment? And what will be the cost effectiveness of that? So this is a very good question. It's, it's very difficult to give a, a definitive answer. Let me tell you, everything is related to cost-effective analysis because um, it is expected that even probably 25-30% of the general population can be carrier, for instance, of uh, FSH receptor polymorphism. If you know it before, you can adapt the dose and probably 30% of patients that are carriers of this polymorphism can benefit from a, a lower starting dose. So the question is, how much does it cost? Because if the cost is very low and uh, it is very easy to, to evaluate, I think that pharmacogenomic approach can be an incredible option. But if the cost overcomes the, the approach of a, a, a higher starting dose in all patients, obviously it's not convenient. And I want to tell you just one thing in brief. So you, we know that approaching IVF all over the world is uh, in time even more related to the idea of a carrier screening before. So in, in USA, for instance, they have a carrier screening for uh, mm, mm, diseases, including uh, cystic fibrosis and whatever. So I think that if we have a carrier screening program and you include the polymorphism of FSH and LH receptor, is not, uh, it is very easy and very cheap to do because you add something to the kit. And I think that this kind of approach, combining chiro screening with the mm, preventive evaluation of FSH and LH receptors can be very cost effective and avoid to give too much gonotrophins in at least 30, 40% of the general population. Thank you. There is one just a small question as uh, the last one. Um, uh, do you think uh, that um, you probably said it, but uh, probably there is some more interest in that Poseidon group two, uh, would you generally suggest uh, that uh, dual stimulation uh, will benefit them? No, I don't think that is good for all patients because you, you, the art calculator, for instance, is aimed to personalize the, the approach. So, for instance, let, let me give you an example. If you have a, a patient 37 years of age and the ovarian reserve is good, you can hypothesize to have uh, 10, 12 oocytes, for instance, in, a, in, a, in the stimulation meaning that probably you will have uh, two or three blastocysts. Considering that at the 37, only 60% of uh, blastocysts are aneuploid, having three blastocysts, the possibility of having at least one euploid is very high. So no further stimulation is required. If we have a patient 40 years of age, 41, which is also consistent with Poseidon 2 group, and this patient had, um, for instance, in the second stimulation, uh, 10 oocytes, the blastulation rate is low. So two blastocysts are expected. And in these two blastocysts, the risk of aneuploidies is 80%. So in this patient, probably a second stimulation makes sense. 
So this is a very good example of combining Poseidon with art calculator. So personalize it. This is crucial. Thank you very much for clearing and clarifying this uh, point. And uh, now the questions that, that we posted, uh, that you prepared, uh, uh, are answered uh, and the uh, calculation is finished. So, uh, Paolo, can you show us uh, the results? And Carlo, I would like you to comment on the results. So, the first question was, how can we uh, uh, counteract uh, polymorphism affecting FSH receptor? Carlo? So I, I think that in an ideal world, I do agree with, I'm very happy of uh, this kind of uh, answer because I do think that uh, this could be an approach. Let me tell you something about this. This is something that people do not consider. But for instance, if you have asparagine, asparagine carriers of FSH receptor, these patients are very sensitive to FSH. So if you give too much gonotrophins in this patient, you have the number of eggs you need, but you run the risk of moving too much progesterone. So uh, having this kind of approach in all patients is also useful for understanding in which patient you need more gonotrophins and even in which patients uh, giving too much gonotrophins can cause problems, including progesterone rise. So in an ideal world, I think that tailoring gonotrophin administration on the basis of genetics is the goal. I repeat, what is important is to make it to have in the future a cost-effective approach to this. Thank you, Carlo. And the next uh, question, please. In which subgroups of patients uh, double ovarian stimulation could be adopted? We touched it already before with some of the questions, but maybe you want to comment on the answers? No, no, this is correct. It is perfect. The only thing is not in all three group three, four. Obviously, it depends on age, the expected annuity rate, the re results of the first stimulation. What is incredible in Duosteam is that you can manage in a very dynamic way. So you can start, what you have, it, you have to keep in mind is what is in my mind the ideal number of blastocysts I need. But if you reach this number of blastocysts in the first stimulation, you can stop the second one. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Carlo, once again, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, for joining us today and uh, clarifying on the management of the Poseidon group. The whole meeting today was dedicated um, to uh, the Poseidon group. And we heard from uh, Sandro Esteves on the history of Poseidon, uh, the activities of Poseidon, and clarifying the subgroups of Poseidon. And Carlo, you informed us on the management possibilities in the different subgroups and how can we reach uh, or at least try to reach uh, the final goal of uh, finding at least one euploid uh, embryo uh, in the number of oocytes in each individual patient uh, belonging to either of the subgroups. So thank you once again for both of you for joining us. And uh, some information again uh, to finish. I want to uh, draw again your attention uh, to um, click uh, the link on the bottom of your screen when we finish uh, this expert meeting in order to um, fill in the survey and uh, receive the certificate uh, for the CME accreditation. And I also want uh, to draw your attention to the next week's expert meeting uh, when we have uh, lectures number seven and number eight. Number seven, progesterone rise the black hole of control of variant stimulation by Professor Jean-Noël Huc from France. And the second presentation will be on ongoing pregnancy rate as a valid endpoint mapping in a new star system. And the presenting will be Dr. Ses Sankara from UK. And you can already watch the both presentations uh, this week uh, on uh, the media uh, website. So thank you once again for joining us today and uh, please join us next week. Stay safe and stay healthy wherever you are. Thank you and goodbye here from 
Medea Medical uh, Academy Education. 